have one member of the audience who is overdue three days. So if she gets up and runs out, it wasn't because of the talk. <laughs> uh, this is what we're going to, what I'm going to start with. Rich and I today are going to talk about the end of suffering. And my whole journey started trying to end my own suffering. I was in graduate school walking, worked my PhD walking into campus. And I had one of those epiphanous step back moments and I could look and see what was going on in this consciousness. And it wasn't pretty. It was just a never ending, I call blah, blah, about nothing worthwhile whatsoever. Uh, tremendously non-productive and uh, draining. What it does, and we've all been there, you, know, you have this immense suffering arising, agitated, aggravated by this blah, blah. Consumes a lot of energy and bandwidth, causes a lot of fears, anxiety, etc., and is really focused on our attachments. Uh, the fact that this is, was painful to me is not unique. Uh, in fact, there was a good study done at UVA, a very recent study, published in Science, the top peer one journal, that looked at just how unpleasant this blah blah is to people. They took uh, 150 UVA undergraduates and set them one at a time in a big room and said, okay, you can't have any devices, nothing to do except just sit there and be at peace with your own thoughts. <laughs> and what they found was that it wasn't peaceful. 12 to 15 minutes for each one person sitting alone by themselves was excruciatingly unhappy and painful to them. They thought, well, maybe it's just the students, let's just go try it on some townspeople. Try the townspeople, same thing happened. They were also really unhappy by having to sit there just with their own thoughts. So the coup de grace at the very end was they said, let's just take some of the undergraduates and we're going to hook them up with a little bracelet that goes to an anklet that will shock them with a painful shock. So if they get too, you know, carried away by their blah, blah, we'll give them the opportunity to stimulate themselves in a way that will take them out of doing this. Surely they won't shock themselves at a painful level just to not have to listen to the blah, blah. But in fact, most of the men did and a quarter of the women did. The women are smarter than men. But people really do not like this. And so it isn't unique that we are going after that as a way to eliminate this. And if we can, decrease our suffering. Blaise Pascal, you guys have all heard of him probably. This is one of his summary comments. This idea that if you can you be comfortable with yourself just sitting in a room alone. It's a good test of yourself, just where you are in your path towards whatever you're pathing towards, to just sit by yourself in a room and see if you're okay with that. Do you like what you see? Or do you not like what you see? You're really unhappy and uneasy being there just all by yourself. So my idea was to see if I could come on some kind of a way to figure this out myself. I didn't know if you could stop those thoughts. I thought it'd be great if we could, but I didn't know it was possible. So I just set off. I said, well, I want a secular process, no religion, no philosophy, contemporary sources. I don't want any scripture that's been passed down through 2,500 or 2,000 years or 1,000 years. It's been through so many hands and so many languages, I really have no idea what they said. I want contemporary sources, videos. I want writing that he, the person actually did, he or she did. And I wanted to be very empirical about it. Do the exact experiments myself, see if they work for me. That's my only criteria. So that's what I did, and I had to be, as I say, at the end of it, hopefully functioning in a real world. So could I stop my thoughts, the blah blah referential narrative, and could I function in the real world? It wasn't, I wasn't sure all that was possible. But I set out to do that, and what I did was some very simple, almost childish type experiments. I just watched my thoughts for like five minutes. You can do this yourself today, you can do this yourself. I just watched and I've had two buckets. I had an I, me, my bucket and a bucket that doesn't have I, me, my thoughts in it. And I just saw which bucket got filled up. You could actually put the buckets, fill them up, 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 up. Found out, not surprisingly, that in fact, the I, me, my bucket was full. There was nothing in the no, I, me, my bucket. So it is all about us. Those thoughts are all about our I, me, my, concerns, attachments, worries, fears, storylines. You ask yourself, how do we build these eyes that we all run around with and you get 
shamed, yelled at, uh, complained about. How do we build this thing? Well, you all have, if you've had kids, you know that there isn't an I at one year old. They're just having a good time. They're just hanging out. They're just exploring their world. Someplace between there and two, two and a half, an I manifests on the scene. This I is heavily generated by genetics, conditioning, family, friends, environment, when and where you were born. That central post is this core I unit. And what we have then, arguably, is going forward a bunch of post-it notes flying past this central post. And these post-it notes either stick to the post and they make up a memory that becomes I, me, my going forward, or they don't stick. And out of a huge number of post-it notes, a very tiny fraction sticks to that post, and that becomes who we are. So what happens, you can recognize this, by the time you're in your late 20s, you have a stick just full of post-it notes with all kinds of haphazardly assembled stories about yourself from grandma or grandpa or your gym coach, or whatever, about what, you, what they think you are. You ask, well, how does the brain actually sort out the one things that stick and the ones that don't stick? Because similar experiences may affect you or may not affect you. Turns out, good study on this one, uh, and the Nature, another big top tier journal, just so hard that the theta frequencies passing across the brain, if you happen to have an experience out of phase with the predominant theta frequency at that time, you won't store it, no matter how important it was. But the brain just arbitrarily has this running, and some are kept, and some are not kept. And you, you have no control over that. Where memories are stored, I think we have, many of us, this concept that's, that there's some kind of a file folder somewhere, some giant hard drive inside that stores these in one place very securely. So we can always get the same pull back out and put back out. Not the case. In fact, the brain just flings the, the memories all over the brain, all over the cortex. Not surprisingly, because you have sensory memories, you have motor memories, you have all kinds of episodic uh, mem memories you're tied to, they're stuck in different places. And what we have found through a lot of research is that the brain goes out and when you come to a situation, it says, okay, I'm gonna walk down the supermarket, the brain grabs everything it can find on the supermarket and sticks them together. We were back in the African build 60,000 years ago, when you came down to the watering hole, it didn't matter exactly what you had seen last time. It only mattered to, to what memories did I have of this watering hole that might have been a bad thing. So it just grouped those together that was a survival tool. But our ability to go back to any discrete event like 9-11 and recall exactly what we saw two or three years later is close to zero. They ran these tests on 9-11, 9-12, and one year after 9-11 and said, okay, what did you feel like on 9-11 a year later? All that mattered was how you felt then, not how you felt at 9-11. You were happy now, you imagined you were happy at 9-11. If you were sad and depressed now, you imagine you were sad and depressed at 9-11. We have very poor recall. The legal system is beginning to take this into consideration, but this is a big deal for plaintiff's attorneys. Looking for where this eye is, you probably all know there is no little person sitting around in the center of the brain as an eye. There are many, many functionalities where the eye comes up, comes into use, and manifest. These are just three different categories that this Damasio, who's a famous scientist, uh, neuroscientist, came up with. You can see different categories of thoughts, different categories of eyeness are all over the brain. There is no eye anywhere. It's just the waves sweeping across the cortex and generating on ad hoc basis different feelings of an eye. You can also do this little drill, which is look the same three buckets this time. When you group your buckets into thoughts about the past, thoughts about the future, and thoughts about now. You look at the thoughts, you'll, the same thing will happen, you'll notice that the thoughts about the past is a huge full bucket. Thoughts about the future, huge full bucket. Thoughts about now, there aren't any. This is like, this is Eckhart Tolle, revisited. You can prove this for yourself though. You may be something about uh, something that happened one second ago. That's not a now thought, that's a past thought from one second to go. Watch yourself and just see if there are any thoughts in now. 
you look at how the brain does this and looks at things like, when am I? You say, well, when are you? One of the great self-inquiry questions I find working with people is to ask, when am I? You know, when is Charles? When is Mary? And just see if, in fact, the same Mary shows up for every meeting. If you watch yourself carefully in the course of a day, you'll see that a different person shows up. Whether you meet with your partner, your kids, your boss, your best friend, just see if the same Mary shows up. Or if it's a different Mary, different categories, different capabilities. As that Mary changes and changes and changes, you begin to look at this and begin to understand that in fact the eye is not one giant thing all glued together that's homogeneous. It's really a bunch, hundreds, maybe thousands. Virginia Woolf said, we have as many eyes as we have relationships. So watch that and just see if the eye really is real. You look at when am I, you keep changing. So how real are you? The brain does basically the same thing, same functional areas. This is the front out here. This is a cut this way. So this is facing like this. And you can see the same areas are used by the brain for remembering the past and projecting the future. These two areas will become very important as this talk goes along. The back one is the back part of the default mode network, more on that later. And the front one is really the front part of that. Very important in selfing. And we use selfing for remembering and projecting past and future. And so it's not surprising those two centers are the big active ones. This will be on the quiz. One question for you to ponder is where do your thoughts come from? As you sit here now, maybe take 30 seconds and just watch for yourself, eyes closed or eyes open, and try and see if you can predict your next thoughts, and if you can see where they come from. Do you think them up ahead of time? You have 30 seconds. Let's be on the quiz. Okay, so did you find a place where your thoughts came from? Did you think up your thoughts? Or did they just come on the scene? Unannounced, unpredicted. They just manifest. So if you don't think up your thoughts, why are you so worried about them? They just come up all by themselves. You're not in charge of them. Another one, another great disbelief we have that's incorrect is we think of what we say. If we aren't thinking something in a narrative internally here, we'll be unable to speak. All experience to the contrary. If you watch yourself going through the day talking to people, you do not pre-think those things before you say them. You just say them. They're just there. A great, this is in Scandinavia, 2014 research, with something called the Stroop test. I mean, you may have heard of the Stroop test. What it is is they do what their top panel is showing there. They put the word, the R-E-D word for red, but they trick you and they color red green. And so the trick is you have to say green. That's what the quiz is. Okay, what is the color that you see? Not the word you see, but the color you see. And so the person sees this thing, bald-headed Scandinavian, and he has his headset on and he looks at that and so he says in his, in his microphone, green. That's what I see, green. So they record the green. They go to the second panel, and they play the second panel to him. They show him the word green, but it's colored in gray. They say, what do you see? What color do you see? He says, gray. But what they do, sneaky Scandinavians, is they put in his ear green. And then they ask him, what did you say? He says, I said green. In fact, he actually did say gray, but they just tricked him. And so we don't know what we're going to say. Even as we say it, if we hear something else, we'll believe we said the, we heard the other thing, said the other thing. But you don't think up what you say. And if you watch yourself in the course of the day, you can see your brain doing this. You can get very quiet and very careful and watching closely, you can see, in fact, you don't know what you're going to say. 
It comes out, you very quickly register it, listen to it, and remember it. So if you don't think up what you say, why are you so worried what you say? Coming out of someplace else. You aren't premeditating this thing. You aren't even conscious of what it's going to be. So what I did was a lot of classical, Ramana Maharshi was my main guy, a contemporary source, I think the great sage of the 20th century. Uh, Henry Cartier Brisson took his last pictures. Uh, Carl Jung wrote the foreword to his, uh, one of his books. Um, BBC, Life Magazine, etc. Very simple questions. Who am I? Which is a useful question, but it's kind of the classic one. But I find where am I? When am I? Who hears? I used where am I and who hears for a long time. And it's amazing how deep these questions can go and how you can work with them. They're very simple, should be non-threatening. There's nothing lethal about them. Just asking a simple thing like, where am I, seemed to be the most logical thing I was a scientist, an empirical scientist, should know. If it's up there all day long talking to me, yelling at me, shouting at me, judging me, whipping me, where is it? Can I find it? I should be able to feel it someplace, and I can't find it. And we can't find it in any of our uh, cognitive neuroscience work either. And what happened is this, uh, the blah blah stopped. I was doing a yoga posture, went up into the yoga posture, blah 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 blah, not me, blah 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 blah, and it just stopped. At the time, I had a thousand people working for me, four research labs and a quarter billion dollar budget. And it was quiet inside, like it is right now. Just very quiet. Just no sound, just very quiet. So I wonder, well, how do I go to work today and run these thousand people if there's just nothing going on up here? It's just very quiet. Won't they see me? Won't there be something halo or some such thing? Won't it look like a strange creature? In fact, nobody noticed. Which makes it something about corporate management. But, but, <laughs> but nobody noticed. It's this way basically all the time. I just do plus, plus over 90 because that's what uh, makes it more believable. If I have low energy, low blood sugar, I'm hypoglycemic, they can start up. Other than that, it's just quiet inside. It's very quiet. You can still use thoughts if you need to for planning, problem solving. It's a different circuit that I'll show you here in a second. But it's just very quiet inside, very still. It's really a cool thing to do. And it gets very sweet, as Rich can tell you. It's a very sweet place. This is not unprecedented, as I found out later. Mata Maharshi, this is what he said about no thoughts. As you got a Maharaj, who many of you probably know, said the same thing. And uh, many other people have said the same thing. I went to my two Zen masters, and when I was questioned by them in Dokusan, they said, you're done. Um, I was speaking at a conference in Stockholm, and this ayahuascaro, uh, one of the Sante Daime church principals, was giving a talk at Stockholm, plenary speech. And at the end of this long talk on ayahuasca, he stopped and said, it's all about having no thoughts. And I saw him afterwards, and I said, you know, I was really surprised you and ayahuascaro would come up with this as the goal of ayahuasca, having no thoughts. That was what his summation was. Now, comes into the, the eye glazing part. This is the default mode network. 2010, this is the seminal research uh, on this default mode network by Andrews Hanna, who was then at Harvard. He's now at University of Colorado. And what this does is looks at selfing. What, what makes up selfing? How does the brain create the sense of selfing? And it uses basically these 11 centers. And the little lines there are how often they talk to each other, how often they're communicating back and forth. The two yellow ones are the ones I pointed out earlier. Those are the two most important ones, posterior cingulate cortex and medial prefrontal cortex in here. Very deep in the brain, almost down to the bottom of the brain. And what they found out is that one side and the other side, they, they break up into two subnetworks. This one subnetwork, and you can see them drawn out out here, the one sub-network creates a sense of you in time. You in the past, you in the future. If you deactivate this sub-network, or either one of the two yellow spheres, yellow centers, then you lose that sense of you being in time. 
There's only now, now, now. Classical mystical experiences. The other one, the other side network, generates a sense of you and others. You in the chair, you in the person next to you, you and your partner. If that's deactivated, or the yellow center's deactivated, you lose that sense of there being anything else. This is the all is one experience, mystical experience. The other one is the now, now, now experience. Classical mystical experiences, whether it's psychedelics, I'll show that in a second, or whether it's non-dual meditation. You produce, the brain makes this up. The brain creates this sense. If you deactivate that part of the brain, the sense goes away. Something the brain has learned how to do in about the last 75,000 years. We broke off from the chimpanzee six million years ago. This is a very recent evolution of ours, of ours. As we got more complicated, more agricultural, more people, complex organizations, we developed symbolic logic, developed language, and developed an eye. Almost all human languages have an eye doing something to a me or an object. So the first real research on meditation and default mode network was in 2007 at the University of Toronto by a fellow named Farb. This top one are as novice people who have not meditated. And what they see is that they have these two, these are, used to be called, they were yellow and now blue, but the same posterior singlet cortex, medial prefrontal cortex, those two centers are active. Blah, 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 taking place, okay? Bottom one, this is now with two months, 45 minutes a day, very simple mindfulness meditation. Everyone's doing it now. What this does is activates a different network down this side of the brain. Lateral prefrontal cortex, posterior parietal, right insula, right down the side of the brain. So you go from this network, which is blah, 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 to this network, which is doing, doing meditation, which is tasking a meditation. No blah, blah, blah. Fast forward to a study I was very much involved in was at Yale, a fellow named Judd Brewer, published in PNAS in 2011. This was 10,000 hour Theravada meditators, 12, 13, uh, 14, something like that. And the three different colored bars are three different classical Theravada meditations. Very, they all, all Theravadas know these. You can see that the meditators, as compared to the controls, actually shut down again our two friends. This one over here is this front one. And this one back here is a coronal slice. It's a slice this way as opposed to this way. You can see again, it's back in here. It's that posterior single cortex. So we deactivate the same two centers. The one unique thing we found in the Yale work was that these 10,000 hour meditators actually had some persistency. It wasn't just like when they stopped meditating, it was gone. It went on. It acted like it was still stayed shut down even when they aren't meditating. In the time between runs, they were still shut down. First time we'd seen that, and there was, I didn't put it up on this one, but there were two centers we found that were actually watching this shutdown process. Apparently, they do a part of the monitoring and control circuitry to see that in fact what was shut down and it was still in stage shutdown. Fast forward to 2014, Andrew's hand up, about the new paper, much more sophisticated, a thousand people study at MIT, looking at all kinds of things, uh, much more sophisticated than what they had before, much more uh, comprehensive on what's talking to what. You can see the left one, the blue one, is the same default network we had. And the one on the right is what we call this tasking network, the one that was down the right-hand side of the brain. And they get much more complex, they talk to each other, and the, cent the green guy in the center is the one that controls which one of these is running. Blah, blah, default mode network, or tasking network, no blah, blah, going back and forth. We know which centers they are that switch between the right side and the left side. Why this matters is here's an example of a paper in 2013, and this looked at who's in charge. New kind of statistics called Granger statistics that can look at fMRIs and decide who's, who's pushing the information which way, who's in charge of the discussion. If the arrow's going this way, if the top one, the default mode network is in charge, Default and the task product network is overwhelmed, and you have very poor performance on tasks and very slow response times. No surprise. Blah, 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 blah. You can't do a very good job on tasks. Contrarywise, as Alice would say, if the task positive network is in charge, 
The other thing happens, blah, blah, blah is quiet, and you can do your tasks unimpeded. And performance goes up, accuracy goes up, response time goes up. What happens though with ADHD is that it doesn't shut up. The default mode network keeps talking, blah, 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 blah. When you're trying to do your tasks and you can't get your tasks completed because you can't shut up the default mode network. So you say, well, okay, where do we do our work then? If our blah, blah is stopped, how do we solve problems? Sounds like it's a big problem. Turns out that, again, Darwinian that we've evolved a very strange, very tiny processor that only can do seven plus or minus two things at a time stored. It can only solve one problem at a time. There's a reason evolutionarily you'd want that. But it looks kind of weird now because underneath that, you've got the wonder of the universe. 100 billion, 200 billion neurons, 50, 75 trillion synaptic interconnections, huge parallel processor, great data storage, yada, yada, yada. Above that sits this little tiny processor, tiny little GUI that could just very down to this giant processor underneath. We use the metaphor of a rider on an elephant, except in actuality, the rider would be very tiny. The elephant would be 100 times as big. So you have this enormous processor offline where all the important stuff gets done. Nothing very important gets done up here in consciousness other than the press secretary for the body, which says, this, I solved this problem. Where the problems get solved, this is an, oh, another good paper, 2009. It looked at solving problems that are like 1, 2, 3, JKL, 7, 8, 9, where you need some kind of discontinuous uh, understanding, some clarity of a jump in perception to solve that problem. So it can't be just simple linear, simple linear logic. And what happens is you get a shift from this back quadrant back here. We can watch the EEG fMRIs on this as well. When the problem gets solved sometime later, you can watch the signal shift to over here, shorter, freq higher frequency. And it's right here, lateral prefrontal cortex, EEG shows gammas. Six to eight seconds later, we can, the pro we can find out the problem is going to be told it was solved. We know, we know as it's been solved before it's become conscious to you. Six to eight seconds before you know it's caught, you're conscious. 100% prediction on this thing. You think, then you announce, I've solved this problem. What a genius I am. I have my own ability to fix this, solve this problem. But in fact, all you've done is blah, blah about it, possibly while it was going on, the solution. It's been done offline. And the, pro, the order sent up and said, look, Louis and I solved this problem, and here's the answer. And you then announce you have, to your boss, you've solved this problem. Quickly here, my esteemed colleague's area of speciality, uh, psychedelics. This is liquid shrooms at work. This is psilocybin, uh, IV injected. One of the best studies, in the, probably the best study in the world right now on psilocybin, done in the UK, of course, not in the US, and Denmark. And what happens here is, is uh, they inject, you can see the, the infusion curve over there, uh, IV now. Coming in, you can see what happens. You infuse this. What they do is then they watch and see, okay, how shut down is this, again, posterior cingulate cortex. The same guy that's guy or gal that runs this default mode network, is that shut down or not? It turns out it gets shut down just like it does with meditation. Psilocybin shuts down the same network, same way default mode is shut down with meditation. And you get, not surprisingly over here, extremely intense effects. Some of your friends who have taken mushrooms could probably describe this to you. I'm sure none of you have done, have done these before, but your friends could probably tell you what the experiences are. But these extremely intense effects do happen with magic mushrooms. Ayahuasca, the latest, the, the, maybe the first real research paper on ayahuasca that's done by a, in a Pier 1 journal just came out literally weeks ago. It's in PLOS One. And what they found same thing as we saw with magic mushrooms. Those of you who have done, your friends who have done ayahuasca, the magic mushrooms, could probably tell you how that there are different experiences, but the core of those are the same two core mystical experiences we talked about in the default mode network, where you shut down self and other, and self and time.
These can fit on the same scale, interestingly enough, whether it's meditation, psilocybin, ayahuasca, whatever it is, hood mysticism scale, it really stacks these things up. And they ran a study on this, a doctoral a thesis study, and they looked at how mystical people are from 32 to 160 range, 160 being the top. And people like myself, who have this quietness all the time, uh, we're in psychedelic at the 160 level basically all the time, believe it or not. Nine of us were at that level of the 36 for basically all the time. Our average is 152. People on psychedelics, 150. Uh, meditators, 143. So this is a very psychedelic state. Once you deactivate that default mode network, it gets very psychedelic, whether you do it with psychedelics or with meditation. And this is what's, what is more pleasurable, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Sex, in this case, sex, drugs, or non-duality. <laughs> Which do people prefer? And the people I've asked about this who have done all three of these, uh, I'm still a version of psychedelics. So this is all secondhand on psychedelics. Yeah, you're in rock and roll. Uh, really, it's better than sex. As Buddha, was, or, yeah, Buddha, as Buddha was supposed to have remarked, if it wasn't this way, there'd be nobody meditating. Uh, because it does, to the people who've had this experience and live in this experience, it's better than sex. Hard to believe, but it is. And finally, um, we have some real-time neurofeedback available to us where you can lie an fMRI, this one was at Yale, and they can watch the PCC operate continuously with about a two or three second time lag. But you can just watch it go in and out of activation. Selfing, not selfing, selfing, not selfing. And if it's selfing, it goes red. Which indicates you have increased activation of the PCC, self-related activation. If it's blue, it's decreased activation of your selfing network. So less blah, blah, blah. In the 10,000 hour people, this is what their curves look like. When they're meditating, deactivated, really deeply deactivated. So when I'm doing nothing, this is my curve. So you can deactivate this thing in a way that it can be deactivated all the time, whether you're doing anything or not, selfing or not, meditating or not. This is what's going on right now. There's a lot of this. Is that the right scale? Yeah, that's about four minutes. Four minutes? Yeah. From left to right. To right. Yeah. Uh, this is the guy who was at Yale, he's not UMass Amherst, or UMass Wooster, putting on one of these head nets. Uh, there's a lot of work, a lot of work going on now by everybody from DARPA and DOD to uh, investors in, in the valley, going after some way to do this thing inexpensively. If you can do an EEG, I mean an fMRI takes a you know, million dollars a Tesla, average good fMRI is three Teslas, three million dollars, not going to be in your basement. So, EEG, though, you can get these things cheap. There are EEG, EEG rigs out now that are $100,000, $200,000. They're going to get even cheaper and better. They're not far away. A guy I'm working with out in Palo Alto, uh, there's a lot of money in the valley right now. Chasing this is the next thing. Three years ago, mindfulness was nothing. Now everybody's doing mindfulness. They're looking for what is the next thing. And they think this could be the next thing.